Welcome back to the channel. We're going to continue working on our 2017 GMC Terrain SLE. Uh, we're going to get it all back together and get it on the road and move on to the next job. Let's get started. We're going to reinstall our quarter glass first so that the urethane has a chance to cure while we're working on the rest of the vehicle. That way we can wash it when we're all done uh, and leak check it at the same time. It's also a job I really don't care for, so let's get it out of the way. So we put our primer on first. Now we're gonna put our urethane on. We cut a V in the nozzle end and kind of makes it stand up a little bit without being too thick. And we'll go up on the inside. That way we don't have to worry about it leaking unless the vehicle is upside down. And then we got more problems than just a window leak. Now we can set our glass in there. There were two tabs that weren't broken. There were supposed to be three. So it'll snap in and hold itself in place. And those are also guides. We only had this out so we could paint it. So it should fit. Push it in the urethane. Make sure we get a good seal all the way around. And if we had all our clips, we could just walk away, but we're gonna have to use some other method to hold it in while it dries, so we're gonna use some masking tape just to hold it in place. Probably a little excessive here, but at least it's not going anywhere. So we'll pull the door speaker out while our urethane's curing on our window. We'll get some other work done. We've got our cavity wax in the bottom of this front door. Make sure that at least one door doesn't rot out of this thing. I feel like pulling the water barrier down, so I just use the holes for the clips for the door panel. And I can see what I'm doing through the speaker hole. We'll put our speaker back in. And we'll put our little molding on the bottom. First, we have to put our clips back in that we just pulled off the molding. We slide one side in, and we use the pliers to push it into the rubber till the other side of the tab clears the hole, and then slide it in there. Put the rest of them in. We left the clips in the panel, then when we cut the panel off, it was real easy to get to the back side of it. And now we push them all in there. And we can put our little filler underneath our mirror on the front door, and put our belt molding on. We use our belt molding installation tool. And we'll put the mirror back on. Snap it in. We'll put one screw in there so it doesn't end up on the floor. Now we'll put our outer door handle on. Put the gasket in. Slide the door handle in. And put the little cap on the back to hold it on. And then tighten up the cap. Make sure it still works. And we'll put our window sweep in. Now we can bolt that mirror in. Since it hasn't fallen on the floor yet, we'll throw the trim around the top of our door, flip it in to the window, and that molding on the outside. One of these days I'll put the window down and make this easy on myself. Today is not that day. Now we can reconnect our wiring harness for our door panel and reconnect our door handle. Line up the door lock, push the door panel down and snap it in. We'll just use the belt molding installation tool for that. Put our bolts in our grab handle and one in our door handle. Then we'll throw the little caps on. One door's done. So we'll throw a tail light in there, plug it in, line up all the tabs and push it in. Now we can put actual screws in something instead of just plastic clips. And then we'll put the plastic covers over our screws. We can put our little gasket in for the hatch. Just pushes in, a couple push pins. And now we'll put our bezel on for our filler neck. Slide it over the filler neck. Snap it in the quarter. Put our cap back on. And we'll clip the tether in. And then we'll put the gas cap door on and bolt our filler neck back in. 
Then we can throw our bumper bracket back on the back. Uh, the other one, we're gonna have to go to Scott's Terrain Emporium and pick it up. Now we're gonna put our rail on for our roof rack. But before we do, we wanna make sure that we click. We make sure that we click. Make, make sure that we get all the dirt off of the roof here before we put that piece on. I, I don't wanna use the C word. I can't, I can't do it. Come on, guy. Nobody's gonna see it. No one's ever gonna know the dirt was up there. But at least we'll have a place for the fresh dirt. Sometimes little things bother me. So we'll clean it up. We'll also make the clean freaks happy. Probably not up to their standards, but yeah, I don't care. So when we're done wasting time, snap our clips in on the front. We used the belt mulling its poison pool since we had it out. We can put our bolts in. We'll put that outer cover on, line up all the tabs, and smash them all in there. We can throw the upper quarter trim back in, the one we were not able to remove because we will never get the seatbelt out without a lot of effort. So we just left it laying in the bottom of the wheel well there. Line it all up. We'll put our bolts in the top and close the little cap. One more clip to clip in on the top there. And now we can put our lower quarter trim on. Slide it behind the seatbelt. Snap it in the quarter. We'll snap the sill plate into the floor. And then we'll use the belt molding installation tool to push this piece of trim into the upper piece. Then we can put our sill plate in the hatch. Pull the gasket out that's trapped underneath it. Now we'll put our spare tire cover in. Push it into its Velcro. Then we can snap the little closeout panel in. Just push the tabs down and push it in. Put our cargo hooks back in to hold our quarter trim on and put the little caps over it. While you were distracted by this handsome looking fellow assembling a terrain, I snuck over to Scott's Terrain Emporium and picked up one of these brackets for this bumper. So we'll bolt that in. Now we'll throw our gasket around our rear door. There are a couple clips that are different colors and that's the ones that start in the corner. Don't ask me what color they're supposed to be. They're just a different one. So we'll snap it all in. Hopefully we have it in the right spot. We'll put our two inch 3M door check in there to hold the door for a second. And now we can put our actual door check in. Line it up, bolt it in. Then we'll bolt the door check into the B pillar so that we can use our temporary door check to uh, line moldings and stuff like that. Uh, now we'll put our cavity wax in the bottom of the door. And the reason I put the temporary door check in there is that gasket goes on the inside of the door check. So if you don't have it out of there, you have to unbolt it, put the gasket around it, and then bolt it back in. This using a temporary door check saves on bolting the door check a couple times. So now we can throw our headlight in there, plug it in, set it up into place. There's that one clip in the back that'll hold it in while we're going to find the screws. And we'll bolt that all in. We'll put our bracket on the bottom of the fender for the bumper and also hold the bottom of the headlight. Bolt that into the fender and into the bottom of the headlight. Now we can throw the headlight in the driver's side that we only had to take off because it was demolition derby day at the auction when this thing was sitting there. So we had to repair the fender. Otherwise, we could have left this on there. Could have just pulled the bumper down and worked around it, but oh well, things happen. So we'll bolt our bracket in the bottom of the fender and bolt in the headlight. Now I think we're ready to put the bumper on. Uh, if we're not, it's too bad because we're putting the bumper on. We'll plug in our daytime running lights. We could probably get to those underneath before we put the splash shields on, but since the bumper's already off, might as well get them now. Set it up there. Line it up on the headlights. And we'll clip in our sides. I actually got the bumper installation tool for this one. Missed one clip underneath the headlight. One more hit with the bumper installation tool. Should put it back to factory specs. 
And we'll put our bolts in the top of the grill. And then we can throw our close off panels in. Line up all the tabs, snap them into the fender. A little gasket on the back here. Push in all the little push pins. And we'll head over to the driver's side. We'll put this close out panel in. Snap in the fender. And put our push pins in. Now we're going to put the little annoying moldings on the side of the cow screen. I always forget to take these off. Probably not by accident. I leave them for the painting gnome, but I always had to put them back on. I think I just pretend that I forget them. Flip into the cow screen. There's one push pin. And then the tab in the back slides underneath the fender. Then we can put our moldings on the bottom of our door. We'll line up all the clips, push it on. Make sure we have them all aligned before we go slamming it on there. If you miss a clip, you gotta start all over. Throw the molding on the front door. Same way, just extra clips. It's a little bit longer. We use the bumper installation tool since we had it out. I'm gonna throw a molding on the bottom of the fender. And we'll throw our door handle on the back. Throw our gasket on there. Slide the door handle in and clip it in. So we can stop reaching inside the door to open it. Put our cap on the back. Screw in the cap to hold everything together. Put our little plug on the back. And now we can throw our window regulator in. Figure out how it goes in here. A game of Tetris. Once we get in there, we bolt it into the door. Pull our door cable out. And we'll put our molding on the front of the door. It slides down there. And we'll put our molding over the top of the door. This one actually goes behind that front molding. But the front molding has to go on first because it has to slide down in there. We'll slip this underneath that molding, clip it into the top of the door. And now we can move on to the wiring harness because the rivets are at my house and I have to go get them. So we're going to keep going with something else before we rivet everything in. Pull the wiring harness through the door, drop the harness inside the door and clip it all in, plug in our door latch, plug in our speaker and bolt that in, and we'll run our door cable through our water barrier, line up the little dimples in there, and stick it onto the door. We're only really going to stick the bottom half on, we have to pull it down again. Plug in our wiring harness. And plug that into the B pillar. Now we'll throw our cavity wax in the bottom of our dog leg here that we welded up. Make sure that any paint we disturbed on the inside isn't going to rust. And while we're at it, we'll just go ahead and cavity wax the rest of the inside of this rocker. So. 20 years from now, all we're going to have left of this terrain is a rocker and two doors. According to experts that are anti-GM and say they rust faster than anything else. Now we're going to clip this useless molding on the bottom of the rocker here. I have been told this is not a useless molding. It is in fact there to help the rocker rust faster. I, I have to agree with those people. That's probably what it's for. I think GM intended it to keep rocks from chipping the paint away, but that's just my speculation. I'll throw our fender liner up in the front. Keep 
it in underneath the fender. Now we'll put our push pins in. Put our screws in our bumper. And we'll put our molding on the bottom of the driver's side fender. Clip that in. And we can put our wheel liner in. Because that wheel liner does clip into that molding we just put on. Other push pins in there. And bolt it in. And now we're going to use my little secret method to extending the life of timing chains and engines and GM vehicles and other vehicles. Um, we're going to do an oil change. Uh, I know manufacturers say you can go like forever without an oil change, but they don't care if your engine blows up. So go about three to 5,000 miles and change your oil and you'll never have all those issues that everyone's always complaining about. So uh, yeah, this has been a public service announcement of common sense. So we'll spin our oil filter off. We can actually see this one and reach it, unlike enclaves. Ah, who's this guy? He's cleaning. What's wrong with him? Next thing you know, he's going to be wearing gloves. Throw our oil filter back up there. If we don't drop it first. get it started and use our torque rag to tighten it up to manufacturer specs. Click, click, click. Always good to triple check. Now we can refill it with some oil. I only have to film this part because, well, if it's not on video, it didn't happen and I would get accused of never putting oil back in this thing. Oops. Common sense isn't so common these days. Cat back on. I took a ride home and got some rivets, so we'll rivet this molding back in. Since the compressor is already running, we'll go ahead and use the pneumatic riveter instead of the Scott powered riveter. A little faster. Well, due to video editing, I guess this is actually slower. But in real life, it's faster to use the pneumatic riveter. And then this one down at the bottom here, it's a lot easier to not destroy the paint when the rivet breaks off. I'll we'll set our stationary glass in there, clip it in. Now I'll put the window channel around the top of the door. And we'll go get our nice clean glass, set it in here. Who is this guy? He's cleaning things that you'll never see. Eh, I had time to waste, I guess. Now we can slide our window track down in the front. Flip our channel in. We need that out so that the window will slide down in there. Slide it back up. Pull the regulator up to it. We can bolt in our window channel and bolt the glass to the regulator. Stick our water barrier up because hopefully we're done going in here. Check our window, make sure it works. So far so good. Unplug our switches. Now we'll put our window sweep down there. Push that on with the belt molding installation tool. Then we can clip our molding in around the window. Probably my 400th terrain door, and I finally figured out it's easier to do this when the window is down. So, yay me. Of course, the back's still a pain, but whatever. Clip our belt molding in. Install that with our belt molding installation tool. Now we can throw our door panel up. The wiring harness through. We'll clip in our door handle. And slide the cable into the back of the handle. And we'll push the wire through that inevitably fell back out. We'll line up the door lock, clip in our door panel and push it down. And we'll clip it in all the way around. Just use the belt molding installation tool since you have it out. 
put our bolts in our grab handle, plug in our switches and snap those in. One more bolt in the door handle and put the cap on that. Our rear door is done. So now we're gonna take our rear bumper apart. We're gonna use all these parts for our new rear bumper. We got a used one, but I'd rather use as much of the original stuff as we can. So we're gonna use this wiring harness, bottom piece, a couple moldings, and all these sensors. We'll even use the absorber. Squeeze the tab and pull the absorber out. We'll pop our backup sensors out with our backup sensor removal tool. Looks like neither of those players, but totally different. Squeeze the tab for the absorber in the back over here. And pop this last parking sensor out. Put a little radar unit out. And a couple of clips for our wiring harness. And take everything out together. Now we can see all the little plastic clips that hold the rest of our bumper together. So we'll pop some of these out of here. These hold the molding in. Moldings. It's actually three moldings. Once we have those out, we'll squeeze the tabs to get the chrome moldings off. It does take a little patience not to break every single one of them. We'll set that off to the side as we're going to need it. Now we'll take the chrome molding off the sides. The middle one comes out first and then the two sides. Take our time, we don't have any extras. And you pull the screws out to hold the lower cover on. And pop the lower cover out. No screw on the other side. And then we'll separate the lower cover from the upper cover. These tabs are a little more forgiving. Now we're going to pull off our sill plate, scuff plate, whatever you want to call it. It's a little piece of textured plastic that just goes on the top of the bumper. Keeps you from rubbing the paint off as you're dragging things over the bumper. If you're wondering why I didn't repair this, I would have, except not only is it torn there, it's torn underneath here, all the way through. This is a very irregular shape like that. So it's not the easiest to repair. It doesn't have to look good, but still, it's a pain. And then this is all, I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's body filler it cracks so it's not the right stuff you're supposed to be using on flexible bumpers and the other side over here matches so I'd have to fix both of those corners this this it's just not worth the time I got a used bumper that was in much better shape and the used bumper had the other molding that we needed to replace this one so our upper bumper cover is all painted we're ready to start putting it all back together uh, it mostly snaps together because manufacturers these days feel that fasteners are overrated. So we're going to use our bumper assembly tool, clip it all together, flip it over, and we'll put the two fasteners in the entire bumper. That ought to do it. And we'll put our little scuff pad on here, line up the tabs, and you guessed it, snap it together. Some require a little more effort than others. Now we can put our chrome moldings on, line up the tabs, and snap them in. These moldings are not as flexible as our bumper covers, so we do have to dial down the power a little bit on our bumper assembly tool so that we don't snap all these tabs off if they don't go in perfectly straight. And we'll snap our reflector in. Just like two little tabs that clip in. We'll put our chrome molding on the other side. Get all those tabs lined up. And snap it in. This is our used chrome molding. Came with our bumper cover. Uh, and what this cost new was actually what I paid for the entire cover. So got kind of a deal on that one. Snap in our reflector. 
Now you can put in the center chrome molding. It goes in last because the outer moldings have little tabs that go underneath. So we'll snap that in. Then we can flip it over and we'll put our little plastic clips in that hold our bumper together. Uh, I guess this is as close as we're getting to fasteners on this thing. We'll drop the energy absorber in there. It also has our wiring harness, all our parking sensors, and our little radar units for the side detection system. Get it set into place. We'll put our little radar units in, flip them in, plug in our wiring harness, and start snapping in our parking sensors. You do have to make sure that none of the little gaskets fall off the parking sensors because they love to do that and you don't notice until you put it back together and it looks funny. So just make sure they're on there before you snap them in there. Now all our electronics are in the bumper. We'll snap in the energy absorber and our bumper should be ready to go back on the vehicle. So we'll set the bumper up there. We're going to plug in our harness over here on the driver's side. And we'll set the bumper up. Slide it in to the brackets underneath the taillights. Flip in our sides with our bumper installation tool. Now we can start putting all the screws in the bumper. One in the bottom, and we'll put the one in the top. And then we'll put the cap over the one on the top because we have to hide that one, apparently. The bottom one doesn't matter. I just put it back how I found it. I don't ask questions. So we'll hide the top screw on this side. Put our little push pins in our wheel liner and a couple of screws. And our screws across the brackets in the bottom. Now we'll put our wheel liner in our passenger side. This was used from Scott's Terrain Emporium. Snap all our push pins in, put our screws in, and our wheel liner is done. So is our bumper. Now we're going to check the lights. We do have to take it for a safety test, so we're going to check our parking lights, brake lights, turn signals, and reverse lights. Make sure everything works back here. We're good. So we'll head up to the front. Headlights, parking lights, bright lights, turn signals, the horn, and our daytime running lights. We'll check the wipers, make sure the washers work. We already checked our brakes, tires, suspension, and all that good stuff. So we should have no trouble passing a safety test. So now we're going to see if we can get rid of these marks on our bumper cover. Uh, we're just going to try buffing them off because I really don't want to have to paint it. I asked the detailing gnome to do it, but uh, apparently if you want something done, you've got to do it yourself sometimes. So I'm doing it myself. Perhaps the detailing gnome just needed a reminder of his assignments. I'll leave him one in the car, written in glitter. He won't forget next time. Our factory nameplate alignment system is all set up for us. We can pull off our little template here. And I didn't measure that before I pulled these nameplates off because I just measured off the other side. Same thing with the terrain emblem on the door. Except this one, I actually have the template for it. So just press it on there, peel off our little template, and then peel off our tape that we use to align it. Don't have to worry about the spacing on this one. Just that we got it in the right spot in the door. Unlike the last guy. I found a good deal on a used wheel, but they have a core charge. So we're gonna have to break this wheel entire down I don't need the tire for getting new ones, but I do need the TPMS sensor that's inside the tire. That way I won't have to reprogram a new one that I might not even get with our used wheel. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. Better to save this one and not have to buy a new one. They are like 60 bucks. So when we have everything we need off of this, we'll give it back to the junkyard, we'll save our core charge. Uh, we don't get to throw it in our own pile, but they can throw it in there. If you're wondering what the point of a core charge is, it's a way for salvage yards to hide a little extra in the price of their parts. Uh, the wheel, this wheel, was $100. The core charge is 40, 40% 40 more. So if you don't have a core to give back to them, they actually make 40% more on the price of the wheel that they're advertising for $100. If you have a core to give back, 
they'll probably get about $10 in scrap and they lose out a little bit, but they still make something. Whereas if they just gave you the wheel for $100 and didn't require a core or core charge, they'd only make their $100. So they're at a minimum making an extra 10%, at a maximum an extra 40%. It's just kind of a shell game, a way for them to make a little extra money. Multiply that by hundreds of wheels that they sell and it's worth their time to charge a core charge. Now we got our tire off, we can get our sensor out. This one just has a little torque screw that holds it to the bottom of the valve stem. So we'll take that out of there and save our sensor. We'll screw it into our new wheel when it gets here. Now we're gonna change our cabin Petri dish or in layman's terms, our cabin air filter. Uh, if you're wondering how I know when to change these, if they're easy, you just pull it apart and check them. Uh, this one, there was no need to check. Uh, you could turn on the air conditioning and you could tell it needed to be replaced. There is uh, lots of things growing in our little petri dish here. And the smell of our little science experiment lets you know it was time to change the filter. So the most important part of the job is to make sure the filter is pointed in the right direction. Otherwise, it will actually make the air in the car dirtier by putting it in there. So once you got it lined up, slide it in there. Close the little door and snap it in. And we can attach the little hooks on the bottom of the glove box. Push it into the little clips. And close it up. Pretty easy job. It should all be like this. Yes, engineers, you got something right. So make sure you change it. Our wiper blade was a little tired and worn out, so we're going to change that. We'll pop this little aerodynamic cover off of there. And then we'll pop our wiper blade off. Set the arm down on the glass so we don't shatter it. And then we'll slide our new blade in there and put our cover back on for maximum fuel efficiency. Use our bumper installation tool for that. Brick job time. Okay, experts, start in the comments. That's the wrong hammer for this job. If you're wondering why I don't show brake jobs, it's because there's probably a million of them on YouTube, so why bother? Not to mention, all the keyboard brake job people will uh, not like the way I did it. So, you do it your way, I do it the fast way. We did mount and balance our new tires, and I did figure out the combination of these center caps. The M points to the valve stem, snaps right on. We're not all like that, but that's how these work. Our terrain is ready for the road. Unfortunately, all the snow is gone, so I don't get to test out the all-wheel drive, but the weather is nice, so I did verify the sunroof operation, and it is working correctly. I verified that a few times. So far, I've put about 700 miles on it, and I've had no issues. It was a very easy job, required minimal work. Uh, should make somebody a nice vehicle. With low miles, I don't expect to have this one long once I finally get the title back from the great state of Illinois. I did have some comments on how do I paint the pearl white and get it to match. Well, we blend a lot of stuff. And actually this color, even though it's a tri-coat, does match quite well. Uh, my bumper actually matched in the back much better than the factory matched in the front. And there's a reason for that. The factory bumpers are painted at a different plant by a different company and then shipped to the assembly line and they're assembled there. It's not like the whole vehicle is painted at one time. So things don't always match. And that holds true for just about every car manufacturer. That's why you're always wondering why your bumpers don't match. There's your answer. Our interior is nice and clean. All the glitter is gone. Uh, the detailing gnome had a little bit of a struggle, but I bet next time he won't forget to buff the edge of the bumper when I tell him to. On a side note, does anybody have any extra glitter I could borrow for future gnome punishment? So it looks like this build is done, but there's only one way to be absolutely sure. It's time to play everyone's favorite game, what's in my console. Oh, we have our standard extra bolts. Yeah, we'll put them in the standard storage spot. Alright, at this point, this is really getting old. Tired of finding this thing. Maybe if I throw it out the sunroof, it won't come back. We can make the experts happy. I'll finally put on my gloves.
Really? As if I needed another reason not to wear them? You know, I bet the experts that tell me I need to wear gloves can probably fit their tiny little hands in these. And you know what they say about people with tiny little hands. They wear tiny little gloves. What else? A box. An empty box. Toy, to Toyota. Hmm. I don't know what those are. We don't need that. Ugh. Looks like we got a drill. I might need this for upcoming home improvement projects. We'll hang on to that. Oh, and we'll also hang on to our Hater's Tears bottle. Although, it is a little empty. That's the problem with these short builds. Haters don't have time to fill them up. Oh well. Well, that looks like it. So, this build really is done. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.